Dr. Jacqueline Weiss, a professor of children's literature. With me is Dr. James Holton, former Norristown Area School District Superintendent. Our esteemed guest from New York City is the author Richard Peck. Included among his many national awards are those from the American Library Association and the National Council of Teachers of English. In 1997, he won the New York Library Association Empire Award. Mr. Peck has brought the Bound Galley for a new 2001, 2002 book uh, published by Dial. What's the title? The title is Invitations to the World, and it's a book for us grown-ups. It's about teaching the young and writing for the young and being with the young. It's about what has happened to me in my careers and in the careers of my friends. I'm looking forward to reading that book. We're going to show the latest published dial book, Fairweather, referring to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. In Fairweather, a prissy Chicago aunt sends train tickets to the fair to her rural nieces, nephew, and their mother. Mother declines, but Grandpa secretly uses that train ticket and escorts his grandchildren. Why is he the book's most lovable character? Probably because I love him the most, and because there's an elderly character in every one of my novels. Because I'm afraid there aren't enough elderly people in the lives of my readers. And he is, like all my characters, tough and feisty and still looking ahead. Dial published A Long Way from Chicago, your book about Joey's Depression-era summer trips to rural Illinois with a younger sister, Mary Alice, to see their tough old grandma. A Long Way from Chicago was your 1999 Newbery Honor Book and National Book Award finalist. Equally nostalgic is its Dial sequel, the 2001 Newbery Medal winner, A Year Down Yonder, in which Mary Alice's father loses his job and has to move with his wife from an apartment to a single room. Why do you often have working class characters? Just as I'm worried that young people don't have enough elderly people in their lives, I sometimes wonder if they know what the source of their family's incomes are. And so I make it very clear what it costs to be an adult. Of course, this jump starts the story because Mary Alice has to go live with tough old grandma for a year, the year that changes her life. In Yonder, you've shown grandma picking pumpkins in unsuspecting neighbors' gardens and generously bringing her Halloween pies to school. She also sells foxes she trapped on someone else's property to buy shoes for Mary Alice. Both Fairweather's grandfather and Newbury winning grandma are nonconformists, which add to humor. Are they imagined based on actual persons or a combination of both? Oh, well, writing a novel is like making a quilt. You gather bright scraps from other people's lives, and then you stitch them together in a pattern of your own. Real life people whom you know don't fit into a book, so you take the traits you want and put them together. And the traits I want for adults include being in business for themselves. Another thing a lot of young people don't know. That's a good answer. In those summer girls I never met, you show a different kind of grandma. Yes. She calls herself by her first name, Connie, and she's a blues singer on a cruise ship. She takes her two grandchildren on what will be her, probably, her last cruise. How else does she endear herself to those grandchildren? She gives them their roots. They're suburban kids. They don't know where they came from. And instead of having another sweet old grandma, their grandmother is a big band singer from the 1940s. She doesn't wear aprons. She wears platform heeled shoes and uh, theatrical makeup. She's in business for herself. Yes. And her grandchildren didn't know adults were. 
And she has a secret motive, too, doesn't she? Oh, yes, she does, but let's not tell them. No, no. Your dial book, Strays Like Us, shows two new neighbors who turn 13 on the same day and go to the same junior high. One is Molly, uh, whose mother is a drug addict, and she's living with her great aunt, a practical nurse. The other is grandson, Will, whose father dies next door of AIDS. Uh, do you find that young people are more tolerant today of AIDS than when you started that book? What a good question. I don't know. Um, I don't know whether they are, but one hopes so. Here again, this is a story about two young people who have to start a new school in a new town. That's probably a greater horror to my readers uh -huh. than AIDS. You're right. Uh, but it also is about the secrets families keep. Yes. and what those secrets cost. Yes. Your 1985 Delacorte book was Remembering the Good Times. Here, Trav, Buck, and Kate are suburban teenage friends who hang out at the home of Kate's great-great-grandmother, Polly Pryor, another feisty aged person. The most brilliant friend is Trav, son of a lawyer who's a school board president. Why does Trav commit suicide? I took Trav from research, of course, uh, because we have a, a terrible problem with teenage suicide, and mostly among boys, often boys in the gifted program. I created him from real life, from many cases of real life. And I wrote the book to tell young people what the warning signs of adolescent suicide are because it occurs in every community. But when I go into schools, I never see the telephone number of the local suicide crisis hotline. Some schools, some whole communities, think they are zoned against tragedy. Is this book part of your effort to uh, combat suicide among so many teenagers? It is, because I think teenagers see more of each other than their parents see of them. They're liable to see symptoms they didn't recognize. At the end, near the end of that novel, when Trav is giving away his possessions uh -huh. to his friends, a, they're unsubtle, but they don't get it. It's a dead giveaway. And one of the letters I got after that book was published was from a student somewhere who said, the trouble with your book is, I didn't read it in time. Oh, oh, that's pathetic. Earlier, I mentioned your working class characters. Buck, in Remembering the Good Times, is a, an example. He lives with his father in a trailer parked at Scott's Sunoco Station. Buck enjoys parental love, but that's not true of the teenagers in your uh, book, published by De La Corte, Secrets of the Shopping Mall. Here, Barney is in eighth grade. He's uh, a foster child. And with him in that grade is Teresa. In order to avoid a gang fight, they pool their pennies and go as far away by bus as they can afford to the uh, Paradise Park Mall shopping uh, uh, department store. After store hours, the two eat deli food and hide under beds in a bedding department. They overcome other store spongers and spies. What inspired your highly original comedy about suburban consumerism that so dominates our culture yes. today? Yes, let's underscore that it is a comedy. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, because you can uh, be more serious with comedy than with tragedy. I wrote that book when I realized that uh, for my young readers, Home was elective, school was optional, but reporting to the mall every day was required. <laughs> you go where your readers are. And so I, I wrote, I wanted to write a satire. Would you like to go every day to the mall? Well, why not just move in? De La Court published uh, your book, The Last Safe Place on Earth, about a divided suburb. Here, some parents go to a high school 
to uh, protest certain library books. Mm -hmm. The principal says they must first read those books and write the quotations that they find objectionable. What have been your book banishing experiences? Well, I have extensive experience as any writer for young people in censorship because any word you write is censorable to somebody. And I wanted to air several kinds of censorship in that book, including the censorship that young people promote. Huh? They are often censors. They, they still dissent at least as quickly as adults do. So you notice in the book, they too are book burners. Huh. But uh, this is a terrible problem, particularly in the suburbs. And that's why that novel is set in the suburbs. And in my research, I learned something about people who want to ban books. Book banners never have happy home lives. Oh, that's an interesting point. Very interesting. Well, as a former superintendent of schools, I've certainly coped with my share of uh, book banning incidents, I'm sorry to say. On another matter, uh, why do you feel that young readers now need the story more than earlier generations? Oh, I believe it. I believe they need fiction even more than I did, and I needed it. Because a, a story is always about change. It's always about moving ahead by yourself, on your own, nearer adulthood. I don't think young people get that message in schools now. And I don't think the peer group likes seeing people moving ahead. And I think the peer group now has the authority that teachers and parents had when I was a kid. What role does a reading play for students with uh, limited vocabularies? Students with limited vocabularies can expand their vocabularies by reading. They can expand their vocabularies by learning lists of words. But they have to give themselves permission first to have a bigger vocabulary than their non-reading peer group leader has. And that's a problem. The other problem is the school that does not send home lists of vocabulary words to be learned with parents. Because a word, a book is written one word at a time and it's read one word at a time. I'm still learning new ones. I have to. Good answer. Your De La Court book, Princess Ashley, shows Rich Ashley, a peer leader, and in high school, her power base. Her date Craig is drunk as usual when he has a driving accident that leaves him brain dead. You've written that, or said, that the drug of choice in adolescence is conformity. Yes. How can uh, books counteract peer pressure? I think every book does counteract peer pressure in that a book always celebrates the individual, not the group. We don't write books about how can I be more popular. We write books about how can I be more myself. We don't write books about how to find a leader. We write books about how to find your own future. But they have to be read, don't they? And so we do all we can do as writers. And then we depend on teachers and librarians and parents to be there for us. Most popular was your Viking book, Are You in the House Alone? Winner of the 1977 Edgar Allan Poe Award for Best Juvenile Mystery. In this televised novel about rape, what did your book include about whom the law protects most, the rapist or the victim? I wrote that book to point out to the young uh, not what the crime of rape is. They know what that is. I wrote the book to point out that life is not a television show, that in real life, the, gu the guilty are inclined to serve the sentence. And I mean, the victim is liable to s serve the sentence and the, and the criminal walks away. Most rape cases, for example, never come to trial. I don't think young people know that. I think suburban young people think all the crime is in the city. This is a girl who is attacked because she actually opens the door when she's babysitting. A city girl might have more street smarts. The young believe nobody would, they know personally, would ever hurt them except mother. 
uh, but mother's never the enemy in my stories. Your best friend tends to be your worst enemy in my stories, as in this case. But it's a story about <clears throat> what the young peer group does to victims, whatever the crime. The ghost belonged to me, and uh, ghosts I have been are among your books for adolescents that mention the Titanic, a topic that's very popular with junior high students. Uh, those two books also feature the character Blossom Culp. Why is she so popular? Well, uh, she surprised me. She began to get letters not addressed to me. Um, I'll tell you how I got her. I gave Huckleberry Finn a sex change. Um, she is the wretched refuse of her town. She's single parented. Yes. She's from a broken home. As she says herself, the porch keeps falling off. Uh, nobody likes her. And yet, I learned from her that young readers will identify most lovingly with the people they wouldn't sit next to in class. Oh, isn't that interesting? I could have learned that by reading Huckleberry Finn, but I had to write a novel to teach that to myself. And yes, and the, and the Titanic, because it is one of the few points of history my readers know. Oh. And you, and you try to expand on that. Yeah, they are fascinated mm -hmm. by that kind of material. Your uh, book, Father Figure, was televised under that name. Why did you write in School Library Journal that Father Figure is your best book? Well, I said that a long time ago. <laughs> I've changed my mind now, but okay. I, I was fond of that book for a long time, and I still am. I am too. Because I don't think we have enough books about boys in the aftermath of divorce and yet there are so many out there. When a divorce happens, a, a boy often feels he has to become the man of the family. Uh -huh. And so the title, father figure, he thinks he has to be the father for his little brother, a role he can't really play. And when they are reunited with their father, the conflict begins. Yes. Can it have a happy ending? No, but it can have a hopeful one. We don't do happy endings. It might leave our readers defenseless. That's interesting. That's very interesting. I did enjoy that book, incidentally, and I enjoyed The Waitress. Yes. Yes. Uh, your 1972 first book about an unwed mother, Don't Look and It Won't Hurt, was made into a movie called Gas, Gas Food, Food Lodging. Lodging. The book was recently reissued as a hardback yes. by Holt. Yes. Why do you have so many publishers? You I do? don't have very many publishers, considering I've been at it 30 years. But the, uh, Holt uh, published my first two books, and then I moved with an editor uh, to subsequent publishers. But uh, what a thrill to have a 30-year-old book back in hardback. I know. I can, I, I thought thrill. it was a big yeah. risk for them to take yeah. until I realized how popular the book has yes. been. And I don't think it's the sort of thing that would have happened to an adult book. I so it's see. another I wonderful see. thing about our field. Um, it's a, you say it's a story about a, an unwed mother, and that's what I thought it was going to be, too, until I started writing it. And then I realized it wasn't going to be about her at all. It was going to be about her younger sister. Yes, it truly did. And how do you hold the family together after an older sister walks away? So it, in my first novel, I realized I was writing a book I had not foreseen. Yes, but you did such a good job of Thank it. You. Thank you. And with female ca uh, lead characters. Well, I had just walked out of my teaching life in a girl's school. Oh. So those voices were still ringing in my head. I, I think see. some of them still are. I see. Do explain a quotation attributed to you. We write not the scene we play but the one we didn't. That is, we write what we should have said. Yes. yes. Uh, a, a story isn't what is. A story is what if. Uh, what if I stopped following the leader and started following my dream? 
What if I stopped blaming my parents? What if I were two years older? What if I lived in another time? I've always wanted to play all those roles. And in a book, I can. Oh, oh. And so can the readers. Yes. Do you feel that young people like to read about characters their own age? No, I don't. I find they like to read about characters two years older. Grade school likes to read about middle school. Middle school likes to read about high school. High school freshmen like to read about anybody with a driver's license and nobody else. Life will start in four semesters. So if I'm aiming at a seventh grader, I write about ninth graders. They imposed that on me. My readers did. Mm -hmm. Why do you visit as many as 100 classrooms yearly? I have to know what teachers and librarians can tell me. I was a teacher once. And on the first morning of the year, I knew things about my students their parents dared never know. I need the truth. And I need to go there to find out what my next book's going to be about, because somebody's going to give me the nudge without knowing it. Going to schools is my source. I don't write about me. I don't write about the time I was young. I write for young people today. I want to write history for them, because they don't have much history. And I want to write about their issues, not mine, because I want them to know a book can be about them. Before you visit uh, students in their classrooms, what do you require from them? I require that they read my books, uh, which is uphill work some places. I also require that they write a paper for me that I can read, so that when we get together, I'm not the speaker and they the audience, but that we are writers together. And the paper I ask them to write is called something that happened to me that would fit into a novel. The most wonderful stuff too. comes I out do. of that. Yes. Like now, some people won't play fair. Mm -hmm. There are 10 million eighth grade boys who will write science fiction. Something that happened to them? I don't think so. But it's fun to see what they will write. They are guiding me, too, in what they want to read. What letter from a student inspired your book, Unfinished Portrait of Jessica? Unfinished Portrait of Jessica came from one of those classroom assignments, something that happened to me that would fit into a novel. And suddenly I realized that I had written in Father Figure the story of a boy in the aftermath of divorce, when he has to become the man of the family. But I realized from a number of papers from young, people, young girls that when a divorce happens in their family, they've lost the first man they ever loved. And they turn ritually upon their mothers and saying, you weren't woman enough to keep him. Conflict indeed. So I wrote a novel called Unfinished Portrait of Jessica to add hope at the end of all that anger. Because about half of my readers come from divorced homes and reconstituted homes. And I have to respect that and be aware of it. Mr. Peck, we've fed a number of questions to you but I wanted you to speak freely about some of your own ideas. Uh, I know that they may be expressed in your new book, but uh, fill in the blanks that we may not have covered well. Uh, as an old English teacher and as a writer now, I believe only readers have futures. Young people are great specialists. They think being well-read is for English majors. They think being well-spoken is for speech majors. Life isn't like that. There's a literature for everything you want in this world, and you've got to have access to it. I wish our schools were literacy training grounds before they were anything else, including psychiatric social welfare centers. I was a teacher once, and teaching is a job you never really quit. You just go on and on trying to turn life into lesson plans. I even have a prayer about it, don't I? Oh, yes, you do. Uh, and uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to uh, ask that you share right. that prayer. Um, and I know that you uh, have written for uh, multiple um, uh, groups. Uh, I know that 
you've written particularly for a wide age span, but you seem to uh, favor uh, books for adolescents, like those you once taught. Yes, and especially the younger adolescents, uh, the middle schoolers. I call them the puberty people. I think that's the darkest time of life. You're too old for childhood and you're too young for anything else. Mm -hmm. What a good time for the companionship of books. I see. Especially today when even previously responsible parents have mostly stopped attending PTA meetings. They need companionship. They need a voice of hope. And they need laughter. Yes, yes. Oh, I don't know how you're doing it, but all of your more recent books are so humorous. Oh, I hope so. I, oh I'm laughing out loud as I read them. Um, I don't know. What are some of your future writing plans that you can share with us, especially for the uh, adolescent uh, uh, reader? I'm definitely going more in the direction of historic fiction. I see. The more classrooms I go into in which nobody knows any history spurs me on. I want to write about different eras and being young in different eras. I want to play those roles and teach a little history while I'm about it. So we'll look forward, uh, forward to more historical fiction. Yes. Um, and uh, you don't now know uh, what time period you're going to be focusing on, do you? I do, but I'm not telling you. All right. All right. Um, I think it's time for us to, um, uh, well, let me ask you, is there some other idea that you wanted to express unrelated to our uh, questions? Because we do have the time. Um, I wish there were more adults in young people's lives, and I want to give them those voices. It's all I can do. When I was a teacher, they often wanted me to be their parent. Uh -huh. You know what that means. I couldn't be, and I can't be their parent now, but I can create elders they can look up to and become. And that's, I think, the highest calling of what we do in this field. What is one of your favorite elderly characters that you wrote about that you can tell us? My, one of my favorites is Granddad in uh, Fairweather mm -hmm. because, again, he is a bit of an homage to my idol, Mark Twain. Oh, oh. Well, you don't choose anything but the best. Um, I want to ask you if you wouldn't mind, please, reading the uh, last part of your poem. No, it's the first part I want you to read, your, of your poem, A Teacher's Prayer. It's found on page 62 of the De La Corte 1994 book, Love and Death at the Mall, Teaching and Writing for Literate Young. And uh, I have a copy of it here. Well, maybe I know it. Oh, you do know it? Oh, God, I'm only a teacher. Take your time and do it <laughs> at length. And it's, and it's lonely work, because I'm the only member of my species in the room. I like kids, and I love my subject matter, and I have higher sta hopes for these kids of mine than they have for themselves. I want them to create. They want to consume. I want them to love the world. They want the world to love them. I want every day to be different. They want every day to be the same. I want them to burn with zeal about something. They want to be cool about everything. I want them to think. They want me to tell them. I want the bell to ring. They want the bell to ring. That is terrific. That poem is in your book, Love and Death at the Mall, Teaching and Writing for Literate Young, and I hope other people will refer to that book again, so I'm trying to implant that title. It's been a pleasure for Dr. Holton and me to have this chance to get to know you. Thank you very much.